Behavioural Economics on a post-it number 35. Um, this is the second of the economic cooperation games that I'll cover in this video series. It's called the Centipede Game. Um, I mean, as I've just sort of indicated, really, as I've just sort of suggested, this is a, an economic game that, that, that has been shown that at least a substantial number of people um, when they make their decisions, behave in a cooperative way that might sort of conflict with the assumption that individuals are egoistically self-interested, that a lot of people think is embedded within rational standard rational choice theory. Right? Uh, and, the, you know, ultimately, com behaving cooperatively could be, could benefit, well, probably does benefit uh, the group that individuals are, operate within and therefore by extension, benefits all of the individuals within those groups. But, you know, there could be opportunities for free riders, for instance, to take advantage of the benefits of competition, uh, sorry, of co co cooperation, um, and yet not not behave fully cooperatively themselves, uh, to give themselves an additional advantage over and above the, those advantages that can be reaped from um, other people's cooperative behaviours. Anyway, let me describe this um, centipede game to you uh, and I'll indicate how it might conflict with the, assumpt the assumptions that individuals are necessarily all the time egoistically self-interested. So the game involves, this is, an ex this is just an example of the centipede game and in my example here it involves two people, Peter and Paul, right? And there's a number of phases that you could possibly go through in the game from phase one all the way through to, to finishing the game. So how it works is that in phase one, Peter can make a choice of whether to take, uh, i.e. stop the game at that point, take what's offered, or to pass the game over to phase two. And in phase two, Paul would make the choice. Paul, Paul would decide on what to do uh, in terms of the progression of the game, right? So in phase one, Peter decides. If Peter decides to take, stop the game at this point and just take what's given, uh, he'll receive four units. You can consider these to be monetary units, like pounds, for instance, right? So Peter would receive four pounds and Paul would receive one pound and that would be the end of the game. Or Peter could pass over to phase two. If Peter passes over phase two, then Paul decides what to do next. If Paul decides to take, then Peter would receive two pounds and Paul would receive eight pounds. Or Paul could just pass over to phase three, in which case Peter would decide again in phase three. If Peter decides to take, Peter receives 16 pounds, Paul receives four pounds. Or Peter could decide to pass over to stage four. In stage four, Paul decides again. If Paul decides to take, Peter will receive eight pounds. Paul will receive 32 pounds. And that would be the finish of the game. Oh, sorry, that he could take. Or he could say, let's pass over to finish the game. If he passes over to finish the game, if he doesn't decide on this allocation here, then uh, Peter will receive 64 pounds and Paul receives 16 pounds, and then that would be the end of the game. Okay. So you can see that if these two players behave sort of cooperatively and pass over to allow the next person to make the decision, then by the time that they reach the end of the game, they'll be very, very, both of them would be very substantially better off than they would be at the beginning of the game, right? <coughs> Excuse me. However, however, let's consider this. Let's just consider stage four for now, right? Now, Paul could either decide to take at this point or pass it over to a finishing stage. If he takes, then he'll receive £32, which will be significantly better than if he passes it, passes it over uh, to the finishing stage where he'll receive £16. So back with, by backward assumption, we might, uh, sorry, back at induction, we might assume, and Peter might assume, that Paul, if we reach this stage, would just take, right? Now, if he was to do that, if Paul was to do that, and Peter realises Paul was to do that, Peter would realise himself that it would have been better for him to take in stage three than pass the game over. 
because if he'd have passed the game, if he passes the game over, he thinks he'll end up with eight pounds. Whereas if he took the payments in stage three, he would get sixteen pounds. Now, by backward induction again, we can assume that Paul would expect Peter to take in stage three, and Paul would realise that if he just took rather than passed the game over in stage two. He would have been better off. He would have received eight pounds rather than the four pounds he'll think he gets. He'll think he'll, he'll get by uh, in his expectation that Peter will just take in stage three. And if you work your way through that by backward induction, um, it is a rash, rational <laughs> from uh, the sort of assumption of egoistic self-interest for Peter to take just take right at the beginning. Uh, this payment here rather than to pass anything over. He would have just took the four pounds to begin with because he thinks that would be the best position for, that he could have ended up in, uh, ended up in, given everything else that's likely to go on later in the game if he did pass the game over. Right? So rational uh, choice theory would assume that the, both players would um, end up essentially in a much worse individual position uh, than they could have done if they had behaved cooperatively because they realised that selfish self-interest will drive them back to this point at the beginning where Peter would be better off uh, taking than passing the game over uh, uh, right at the right at the beginning in stage phase one right so that's the that's the that's the prediction where we'd end up with with rational choice theory taking Peter taking four pounds and basically allocating one pounds to Paul. Right? Now, that's all I've said here, basically. I've just re reiterated what I've said there. Now, when you play out this game, um, in reality, uh, in the small number of studies that I've seen on it anyway, some people do, I mean, it, it's relatively rare for us to go all the way through to the finishing point, but it's quite common. It's very, it's, it's very, it's very common for us to get at least part the way through these stages, at least part the way through these stages. So there's, there is at least a degree of cooperation or trying to signal cooperation to go on, at, you know, to happen as we go through the game. It might be that we reach a point whereby one person would have been better off by taking in the stage earlier than they do, um, and rather than passing on and giving the other person to, to take at that point, and therefore that, person that could have took in the previous stage would have ended up better off if they took. Right? But nonetheless, they if you end up at stage three here, they would still be, say for example, Paul here would still be significantly better off and Peter would be significantly better off than if the game ended right the way beginning at, at stage one, at phase one here. Right? So um, in conclusion, what the centipede game appears to say in terms of the empirical evidence is that Many people, not everybody, but many people violate the assumption, if you like, that they will necessarily be egoistically self-interested. And it appears to indicate, like the um, public goods game that I talked about in the previous post, it that many people wish to demonstrate or wish to signal to others that they are willing to be cooperative. So that's it, the Centipede Game, Behavioural Economics on a post-it number 35.